that you can imagine, like any living organism, that's part of your everyday work, you develop a certain affection for it. The cone snails are interesting creatures. They are, like most snails, slow moving, but unlike most snails, they're venomous, and they use their venoms to be able to immobilize prey. Our hope was that we would have some basic science impact. <laughs> it wasn't so clear that that would be attained, and this was completely unexpected. We didn't start out with the idea of we're going to research these cone snails and we're going to come up with a pain medication. But as we got into it, there was this incredible gold mine of compounds. We didn't realize that, you know, we will have a whole life's work. So I grew up in the Philippines. I uh, was an only child, and my parents uh, moved to a home that was very isolated. I began collecting shells, maybe when I was about nine years old. That's how I became quite seriously uh, involved in, in shells. I got an offer to spend four to five months uh, in the U.S. And so it essentially was the fact that when I returned to the Philippines, we had to find something to do, which did not require any fancy equipment because we had none. Doing science in the Philippines at that time was quite difficult. And this is where we all agreed that Oh, we should work on something that we will have an advantage of. And, that, and then he suggested working on the cone snails because we have diversity of cone snails and we can easily get it. And so we began working with undergraduates and, and then they'd come up with their own good ideas. I went to Dr. Oliveira's laboratory, and I was fascinated by the work. So the project that I was assigned to, and that Craig Clark was assigned to, was to take different species of cone snail venom, purify them into their component parts, and determine their biological activity, and determine their chemical structure. There were a couple of breakthroughs. The first was the observation that some of the components in the venom, although they paralyzed fish, didn't paralyze animals. They acted on the nervous system, but not the muscle. What he and Michael found was that there was a very, very potent component that caused mice to shake in a very characteristic way, very abnormal shaking. By this time, we knew that uh, all of these were a class of molecules called peptides. Michael purified all the omega conotoxins, and that turned out to be extremely specific for only one type of calcium channel. an aha moment of this may be useful for blocking pain without causing paralysis. And what was so astounding was that this peptide that's used to paralyze fish has an application that can treat pain in a human. It was found to be a thousand times more potent than morphine, but importantly, it doesn't cause tolerance. It took a long, long time, and for complicated reasons. So it didn't get approved until 2004. So that's how long it took. Federal funding has been an essential component of the research that we're doing. 
wouldn't have happened without it. They didn't say, well, we're going to give you this money and you've got to come up with a drug. They said, do the exploratory science. We think this is interesting. And that incredible flexibility has really been supported by funding basic science. I think all of us are not the type that will be doing things according to the books all the time. Uh, follow your curiosity and doing it and you'll be surprised at what you end up with. In many ways we were in the right place at the right time to be able to make these discoveries. I'm grateful for the team that we had to work with but but humble in realizing that in many ways it was a gift.